in one sense, what it means to be American is to be continually arguing over what it means to be American. So that's that's the baseline, and I think we should just get comfortable with that. And 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 to me, the point isn't necessarily to have fewer arguments in American civic life; it's to have less stupid ones. And I don't mean to be glib. Less stupid means both arguments that are more rooted in fact and history, but also arguments that recognize that we are emotional animals. We're not just fact crunching machines uh, and arguments that are honest about power. A big part of what Kim is referring to and all these trends that have accelerated the disinformation and the divisions and the willingness of people to believe in conspiracy theories uh, or to just disconnect altogether from politics has to do with this deep tectonic multi-generational shift of inequality in our country the structural shift in which fewer and fewer people control more and more clout, money, voice, wealth. Uh, and when you have that kind of slow drift over several decades, you're going to get a democratic crisis like we're having right now. You're gonna have a crisis of legitimacy and all the old arguments that have always been with us are gonna be supercharged, turbocharged, and our politics becomes much more life and death, zero sum, scorched earth, must have final total victory. Um, and that is a dangerous place to be because democracy is a game of infinite repeat play when it works. And if your goal is final victory in which you've wiped the other side, the other off the map, um, that is no longer compatible uh, with democracy. That's the kind of politics you see in countries that are really hospitable to dictatorship. Jennifer Sherman, you're taking time to work with people uh, facing poverty, facing a lot of issues. Are these political divides a higher level thing? Are they are they focusing on these kind of issues at all, or are they just kind of struggling to get by? What's your sense? I think it's probably both. Um, I think those political divides structure the way they think in increasingly intense ways. Um, but at the same time, I, I do think that people who are really on the margins are not necessarily focused on politics first and foremost, um, nor nor do they think of themselves as having any kind of political voice or political clout. I hear over and over and over again that um, it's really fueling the frustration for a lot of the people I work with is, is that they feel like their voices aren't heard, that they don't matter. Um, and, and that I think creates that, that you don't have to compromise. If nobody's listening to you, it doesn't really matter what they're saying uh, or what you're saying. You know, I, I think if you're isn't, uh, you know, as the other speakers have pointed out, it's not whether or not we should have divisions. We sh we've always had them. We are we are a country where freedom of thought and and speech is encouraged, and so we're always going to have different opinions. But I do think we we have an increasing problem with the depth, the divide, and the lack of recognition that the opposing side is worthy of being heard or understood or compromised with, um, either because you feel like they're not listening to you or because you feel like they don't matter at all. So my hope would be that we start looking for ways not to eliminate those differences of opinion, but rather to uh, reach across and seek some sort of compromises that actually respect other groups and tr truly do look for the best solutions rather than just trying to win or you know burn down the other side. Um, so I think the issue isn't really the divide itself existing, but just how big it's gotten. Um, and also that kind of circle the wagons mentality that your caller mentions. I think that can be a problem. The, when we stop listening to each other, we have a problem. But also when we stop feeling heard, we have a problem. Well, uh, certainly in our history, circling the wagons and staying strong, staying committed to your, uh, to your issue has advanced a lot of things in our society. Uh, Jennifer, uh, you mentioned that maybe that's not the way to go, but I wonder, Kim Wyman, when you hear someone say it's time to circle the wagons and stay strong, is that an affirmation of taking a strong role in our democracy or is that rejectionism? What do you think? Oh, I, I, I'd like to think it's a, it's going to be people engaging in our democratic process and voting and, and getting involved in campaigns and all of the things that really do make our democracy strong, at least from the election standpoint. But, uh, but at the same time, you know, it, it's, it's what moves our country forward. And sometimes it's painful. And I think that 2020 is the stellar example of how painful it can be when we really are retreating to our left and right corners and aren't listening to each other and 
it's breaking down to a point that the people's ideas aren't even bad anymore. The people are bad. And I, I don't have to listen to them because they're blithering idiots. And, and both sides are guilty of it. Both sides do it. And um, we have moved to this place where compromise is somehow a four letter word suddenly. And, you know, maybe we need to talk in terms of pragmatic, but, but it, it uh, I hope it translates into uh, political action and engagement. But, uh, but I think what we've seen is, is more of, it's just easy to complain on social media. <laughs> I, I get more, more validation from that than going to the polls. I'm Ross Reynolds. This is Rebuilding Democracy, a special statewide broadcast. My guests, Washington Secretary of State Kim Wyman, Citizen University founder Eric Liu, and Washington State University sociologist Jennifer Sherman. Well, I thought I was pretty clear on why we see a deep political divide. There's disagreement about the results of the election. There is an insurrection in Congress. But I got schooled when I heard these listener comments. Why is it taking place? Well, it's it's taking place because of uh, government policies and the fact that most of us don't feel that our vote counts when 49% of the electorate's vote, in fact, does not count. Our form of government is causing the divide. Hello, my name is Brenda, and I am calling about the issues that we think that are dividing the democracy. I don't agree with helping a lot of other countries when we can't when we have veterans who are sitting out on the streets i mean we really need to take care of our own people first uh and there's a lot of poor people and i think the people making the decisions are the ones that are wealthy and they can't comprehend us not wanting to help others it's not that we don't want to help others it's that we want to help our own people Thank you for this opportunity. Hi, my name is Hannah Cole, and I'm calling from Bellingham, Washington. I think part of the reason that we are having such a huge divide in our democracy right now is that we took our eye off the ball um, when it came to keeping valuable jobs and pride in our own country. The utter polar divide, I believe, has happened because in 1963, the Supreme Court removed prayer and Bible reading from our educational systems. I mean, it's all been downhill ever since we took prayer and Bible reading out of school. Eric Liu, how can we mend divides if, as we heard there, there's a lot of disagreement about what the divides are? Well, I think... The through line in all those comments and part of what Jennifer was referring to as well is, you know, we're living in a time right now where people across the ideological spectrum in rural areas and big cities um, feel universally unheard. Uh, there was a poll that the group More in Common uh, recently ran toward the end of last year and across every demographic uh, category, the one common fact uh, that came out of this poll was that Americans feel disrespected. It's kind of a remarkable finding when you think about that. How can everybody be disrespected at once, right? And to me, that is a function of many things, including this incredible grinding inequality that's making people feel so status anxious and insecure. It's also a product, let's be honest, of the fact that the demographics, demographics of the United States are changing. The demographics of Washington State are changing. And the day is within sight where we are no longer a majority white either state or country. Uh, and you can begin to visualize that. And that's created a lot of anxiety and zero-sum thinking uh, in our politics. And so um, when you recognize these things going on underneath, uh, to me, it's not so much about talking about divide, this divide or that divide on this issue or that issue. The first thing that has to happen is at the level of culture, at the level of the human heart, which is to find a way for people in the first place to feel seen and heard and respected and to be able to rehumanize civic life. And that's not from the politicians on down. That's about us as members of the body politic. Uh, citizens, not in the sense of documentation status or passport holding, but just members of the body, contributors to community. Do we see each other? Do we really want to see each other and humanize each other, even if we may pray different, vote different, think different, uh, speak different from one another? And uh, that is a commitment that has to start uh, from here. And I think. Um, our politicians in many cases are not helping. Uh, I think Kim Wyman is correct, and you are too, Ross, in your point that, you know, th there is righteous certitude 
uh, and dogmatism on both sides of the ideological spectrum. But if we're going to face a problem, we got to be honest about naming it. And one of the realities of our time right now is that one of the two major parties in the United States is detaching from its commitment to democratic self-government. Is You're speaking of the Republican Party, working actively, correct? Working actively to limit access to the vote. And so when you're in a situ situation like that, the only way to do this is not through party politics and Republican Democrat, but through neighbor to neighbor context of who are you? What's your story? What is the pain that brought you here? Why do you see the world the way you see it? What formed you? What shaped you? And let's talk about that so that we can rehumanize each other. And that doesn't mean kumbaya, we're going to agree on issues A, B, and C, but we're going to be able to disagree without being evil, but, but without seeing each other as evil demons who must be destroyed. Uh, Kim Wyman, uh, you're the only statewide Republican politician on the West Coast. Eric just mentioned the, the thought that one party is kind of working against democracy. What do you have to say to that? <laughs> well, I, I've been in elections for 29 years and, and an election administrator before I was ever a, a politician, as my husband would refer to me as. And um, my colleagues across the country, you know, certainly all of us see elections through our partisan lens. And I think that we're seeing in the aftermath of the 2020 election, Concern by Republicans, uh, the recent Elway poll that said 60% of Washington Republicans believe either the national election was stolen from the president or that their vote didn't count accurately. And that is problematic. And I think we're probably reflective of the rest of the country. And so it's very easy to dismiss that as, well, you know, those Republicans are just trying to suppress a vote. They don't want anyone but their people to vote. And and to be fair, I, I know that many of my colleagues have introduced legislation that uh, definitely makes it more difficult to vote than it is here in Washington. And I'm really proud of the system that we've built here because our system balances access and security very well. But with all of that said, it's we've got to find a way to have these conversations to to first and foremost instill confidence and inspire confidence in those people that don't believe that their ballot was counted accurately. Um, first and foremost, because if people don't believe the election results, they don't believe the leaders are legitimate. And that's where democracy risks breaking down. If people don't believe the people in power are here because they were elected fairly, uh, we've got much bigger problems than whether we agree or disagree. So I, I think it's really important. And this is certainly a thing I'm working on with my colleagues across the country is trying to talk about election administration policy in terms of balancing access and security. So both sides feel heard, both sides feel like the election was fair. And when those get out of balance, when you make it too accessible or too secure, the other side believes that the election's rigged and that's what's at risk. So we, we have a lot to, we've got a lot of work to do. I just, Jennifer, go ahead. Ross, I, I, I want to say two things. One, I, I want to actually commend Kim Wyman because she is one of the few Republican officials around the United States who was willing to stand by the legitimacy of this last national election and by our own system of voting by mail. Um, and, uh, you know, like uh, Congresswoman Butler, uh, you know, was willing to actually uh, challenge a lot of the voices within her own party. And th that is a kind of political courage that we need to see more of on both sides. And I think that is a really important thing to emphasize. At the same time, um, I, I don't think it's right to abstract uh, or, or, or make too conceptual this idea that uh, the debates we're having are simply academic debates between uh, access and security. Um, we are where we are, where 60% of Republicans believe that the election was stolen in large part because their leader, in the, who previously was in the White House, amplified and fed that lie. Uh, over and over again with the aid and abetment of plenty of media outlets and other elected officials. And you get what you get from that. And I think the way to repair that, you know, Kim and I are in absolute violent agreement that belief in the system and legitimacy is all we've got here. Democracy works only if enough of us believe democracy works. There's no magic wand. There's no dictate from the top that says this works. This is only if we trust in it, right? But that trust has been eroded by the, pri by the, by the, by the previous guy uh, in the White House. Uh, and that is now work that falls to us as citizens to repair that trust. And I think in a big way, beyond elections, this is about us rehumanizing our politics. If you're in a bubble 
in an echo chamber, whether it's QAnon or otherwise, and you don't know anybody who thinks differently from you, then you're never gonna break out of conspiracy theory. But if you have human relationships in a variety of ways, in your work life, in your family life, in your faith life, uh, with people who are like, come on, let, let, let's, let's, let's see the world more widely. And do you trust me? Um, I think that's the way we bottom up, build back some faith um, in the possibility of democracy. Jennifer Sherman, you heard that list of the different reasons that people thought we were divided, everything from taking a Bible reading out of school to the democratic system not working to difference of opinion about opportunity in our country. Um, when you put all those together, does that, do those resonate with you? Or is there something even beyond what we heard from all those folks that's kind of sliding sideways? I mean, I think all of those comments resonate with things that I've heard in rural communities for honestly decades. Um, these are, there's a wide range of things people are, are concerned about and have been for a while. Um, and I think that this, this sense of not being heard and not being part of the conversation and really not being represented has been there a long time as well. Although uh, as Eric and Kim were explaining that, you know, recent events have exacerbated that to a point where we, we might really be at a democratic crisis, but it's been a long time that people have been saying that they don't feel heard. And it's also been a long time that they've been complaining about all these things. We're not taking care of our own. We don't have jobs. Um, you know, I think, all of those comments to me together spoke to what is just a problem of growing inequality in America more generally, as Eric mentioned, and, and the role that, that structural inequalities, inequalities of things like race, class, gender, and you know, rural versus urban geography play in how easy or hard it is to make it in America. And they structure whether or not you feel like you're valued by society. And when you don't feel valued, it's really easy to feel also unheard. Um, you know, because I work mostly in pretty racially homogenous rural communities, the inequalities that I hear about the most do tend to be those based in social class differences. Um, and I, I see a lot of things relating to that, the kind of in, the visible and invisible advantages and disadvantages that social class confer. And I think a lot of comments speak to that in different ways, um, the ways in which we are divided by these experiences of wealth and income, but also education and culture and who we know and all of these things that make it easier for some people than for others. Um, if you're on the wrong side of that divide, it can be really, really, really frustrating. And I think it, that just not only creates a situation where people feel like they don't matter and they're unheard, but makes it very easy to believe um, these really outlandish, theories about you weren't included, you you actually weren't counted, all right? It doesn't really matter if, if it's true, if it resonates with how you already feel. If you're listening and you'd like to share your questions or your comments, you can email us, engage at KUOW.org. If you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, share your questions down in the chat section. We've been talking about whether democracy needs rebuilding. We've spoken about where the divides exist, and we'll certainly return to those topics. But Let's turn now to what we might need to do. Ellensburg Mayor Bruce Tabb told Northwest Public Broadcasting's Sue Ann Ramella the key to bridging ideological gaps was not bridging divisions, but instead focusing on needs that everyone could agree on. So what are some projects or policies that you and city leaders were able to work on with that common ground and common goal? Yeah, throughout the state, affordable housing is a significant issue. The city of Ellensburg through, with the support of its voters, passed a sales tax increase, which supports the creation of affordable housing and maintaining affordable housing in the community. At the same time, the county has an affordable housing and homeless fund, again, to address similar issues. We are currently working jointly on a project for basically an apartment complex. We were able to take a portion of the money that the city had, a portion of the money that the county had, both contributed to the pot, and because of that, we're able to get that project moving forward. And it's actually, I think, breaking ground within the next 30 days. That's a very, very concrete example of our ability to reach across ideology, potentially, or, or party line. Eric Liu is focusing on the divisions, the wrong approach. Do we need to instead be focusing on the issues we can't agree upon? 
Well, I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. I think, you know, one of the things that we've got to do is find the ways that we can best contribute. There are certainly, uh, there's no shortage of problems that need fixing and solving. Um, and there are no shortage of ways that we can actually um, solve some of those problems that don't force us to relitigate over and over again our ideological differences. So uh, just today, actually, included in the uh, the rescue bill, the COVID relief bill that uh, I think is about to be signed by President Biden um, is the largest investment ever in national service. I'm a huge believer in national service, in AmeriCorps, VISTA, Senior Corps, programs like that, um, that bring people together, not to talk about me or you, but to talk about a third thing that we're going to together work on and fix and address, right? And when you think about that being especially pertinent for young people uh, and a universal expectation of young people for national service, um, you know, th that to me is one of the ways in which we can start, start solving problems more. But I, I think there's a deeper question here um, about structural change. And um, over the last couple of years, I had a chance to co-chair a uh, bipartisan, cross-partisan uh, commission of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And the commission's focus was on reinventing American democracy. What is it that we need to do to rebuild and, and, and firm up our institutional and cultural foundations? Um, and we came out with this report last year called Our Common Purpose, uh, 31 recommendations that run the gamut from some of the things that we've already done here in Washington State uh, uh, around voting and calls for national service and calls for um, you know, some more um, uh, am ambitious proposals like expanding the size of the House of Representatives uh, to make that body far more, uh, in fact, uh, in touch with uh, the people, uh, limiting the terms of Supreme Court justices uh, over time. Uh, but I wanna emphasize one key part of that report uh, is about culture, is about not the rules of the game. And one of your callers earlier talked about how frustrating it is that you can have a candidate earn 49% of the vote um, and then you get no representation. That is partly a rules of the game issue. That's only because we have a system where it's first past the post, winner take all. But there are a lot of other ways to structure elections uh, and it can be multi-member districts. It can be ranked choice voting. There are ways that we can imagine changing the rules so that people feel that the system is more responsive to them. But Eric, the I'm glad you brought that up because I'd, like I'd like to turn this question to Kim yeah. Wyman. You heard uh, that caller say the problem is our election system allows for one winner. So half the electorate feels disenfranchised. And there are different uh, election methods. Some are we're looking at it here in the state, including ranked choice voting, which some would argue would allow people to be more invested in democracy. What are your th thoughts on just the way we do these elections, winner take all? Well, remember, any type of election system you use is going to influence who wins. It doesn't matter if it is a top two primary or a uh, partisan closed primary where you're you're only allowing Democrats to vote for the Democratic choice to go to the general to instant runoff voting and ranked choice voting or even proportional voting. Each of those systems has their strengths and their weaknesses. Uh, and, you know, I've heard a lot of arguments for all of these voting systems, you know, being the solution and, you know, Remember, and, and I'm going to take a little longer view, you look at the last 60 years, we've had a pretty laser focus in this country of trying to increase turnout, increase engagement, increase voter participation. And these are all healthy, good things for democracy. We've passed federal legislation, five different pieces of federal legislation to that end. And when you look at the work of um, Michael McDonald down in uh, the University of Miami, he's been tracking this and all of those efforts have resulted in the same participation level of the eligible voting population. Now with the one asterisk, I would say the Voting Rights Act did actually enfranchise a large number of, of voters. So that's probably the, the big exception. But, but I say this because what really drives engagement, what drives people to be um, engaged in, as voters is that they believe that their vote makes a difference. And these divides we've been talking about tonight, particularly the East-West divide, not even Democrat-Republican, East-West, um, I have talked to so many people in Eastern Washington that completely believe that their vote is meaningless, completely believe that it doesn't matter because Seattle and King County are going to swamp the vote every time, and it doesn't matter, and that's why we haven't had a Republican governor in 40 years. And it's all self-fulfilling prophecy on some fronts because they don't vote. <laughs> and then, you know, the outcome goes the way that they expected it to. So, you know, I, I think the, the thing I'm proud about with Washington and, and Eric, to your point, why I always go to this balance of access and security is um, because it takes some of that partisanship out of it. 
let's face it, both sides, when they get control and they get control of all three chambers, either in Congress or in the legislature, they are going to drive the train to advance election policy that does they think believe uh, they believe is going to help their side win, and it's not healthy. What's not healthy is is having these discussions on one side or the other, completely Republican or completely Democrat. We've got to we've got to engage both sides. It's one of the reasons I have a lot of trouble with HR one and S one. Uh, you know, is that it's what are only they? the Democratic voices. So, but the Republicans are just as guilty of it. So, so we've got to find a way to talk about it and take that polarization out and advance ways that are going to engage voters. We got this question from Lori on YouTube. How do you have this conversation when people don't agree on facts? We can then disagree about what to do with them, but it's impossible to move forward when the foundation of truth is not the same. Jennifer Sherman, do you find that that's really a problem with folks that you're talking to? Um, sure. Yeah, <laughs> I, uh, uh, I'm currently doing a project where um, I'm talking to people about their experiences in rural justice systems. And for example, I often have no idea what way they're going to turn when I ask them about the pandemic. Is it real? Is there really a disease? Um, what do we do about it? Um, there's, there's all sorts of ideas and opinions out there and very little agreement. And honestly, there's, there's not even, I couldn't get a friend in why one person believes one way and one person believes another way. Um, I think there's, an increasing problem for sure that we we don't see the world in the same way. Um, on the other hand, I think that there are some social problems that most people see, or at least a lot of people see. And so I, I want to go back to the the clip that you played from Bruce Tab because I think it was it was a great example in the sense that most of us agree that housing is necessary and the lack of it is a problem. Um, we don't necessarily agree on where it should be cited or who should pay for it or a lot of other things about how to access it. But I think that there are some issues that we all agree upon, um, and even though there are any that, that we don't. I think um, there's room for, for working together on those kind of more proximate needs, the ones that are are more visible to everybody that you can see, that you can feel, or that affect you personally. And maybe it's about healthcare at this point. I think whether or not you believe there's a coronavirus, you believe that um, you don't have healthcare access or you do. I, I think there's a sense there that that's an increasing problem. I think we we all can probably agree that we need more protection workers, um, whether it's for wages or their health and safety or weathering economic downturns. And I think that there are places where there's still room for compromise if our, our leaders are willing to meet in the middle. And I think that's a really big if right now. A really big if. And we're going to hear some, uh, some tape about ways that that's being attempted. You're listening to Rebuilding Democracy. I'm Ross Reynolds. It's a statewide broadcast. And you can also, you're also watching on YouTube or, or um, other spaces. My guests are Washington Secretary of State Kim Wyman, Citizen University founder Eric Liu, and you just heard there from Washington State University sociologist uh, Jennifer Sherman. So we've been talking about whether there is a problem with our democracy, and we've been talking about what that problem is. Next, let's hear what listeners had to say when it comes to what needs to be done to build democracy. Hi. Democracy is really a precious thing. I think that all news organizations, including those on television, radio, and online, should be mandated by the federal government to only share to the public verified truth, as as done in any highly journalistic journalism type uh, uh, prerogative. So if th these organizations do not do so, I think there should be a sliding scale of fee punishments, uh, up to so many punishments, and then uh, these organizations should be threatened then to be eliminated. Yeah, my name is Dan O'Connor. I was a former U.S. history teacher and world history teacher. I'm retired now. Race has never really been dealt with in America. Cheap and free labor has been the bottom line. Until we are willing to begin to deal with 
paying a reasonable rate of wage for the working class and giving race all of the attention it needs economically, school-wise, you name it, I don't think we're going to have a united country. Hi, my name is Dave. I am struck by the fact that um, the two really big issues that seem to be tearing us apart as a country are abortion and gun rights. I'm both a feminist and a gun owner. But I, I have to say, can't we compromise somehow? I was a six-month baby. Could we maybe restrict abortions to the first trimester and then exceptions for medical reasons after that? And could gun ownership be limited in number, in magazine size, no more than eight rounds? Isn't there any way we can kind of work toward the middle by everybody giving up some of our God-given rights or goddess-given rights? Hi, it's Cecile Andrews. Uh, Our philosopher, American philosopher, John Dewey said, democracy is born in conversation. Again, democracy is born in conversation. My name is Adam, and I've been living in Yakima going on three years now. I know it's not a new idea, but I have become convinced that one of the only sure ways to have an honest political discussion across the aisle is within the context of a larger relationship or a friendship. I think that helps us avoid demonizing the other person and from writing off their perspective when it conflicts with yours. So Adam talked about a a personal project to bridge differences and Cecile talked about an effort at the Finney Ridge Neighborhood Center in Seattle to get people talking at KUOW, our Ask a Project brought people together to encourage dialogue. And Eric, I know Citizen University focuses on bringing people together in dialogue, but it doesn't seem to be working. Is there something about it that no longer works, Eric? Uh, I don't know that it doesn't seem to be working. I think we, we haven't fully tried it yet. You know, it, it, this, this calls to mind the, the, I don't know if it's a real quote or not, but uh, Mahatma Gandhi was once asked, what do you think of Western civilization? And he said, I think it would be a good idea. Uh, and, and I kind of would say the same thing about American democracy. What do you think about American democracy? I think it would be a good idea. I think it'd be great if we all committed to showing up and taking that kind of responsibility that all those callers in their different ways were enumerating. You know, when Kim was talking earlier about the, the self-fulfilling prophecy of a lot of voters on the eastern side of the state that, oh, they're not going to be heard, so why bother voting? Th- that is an absolutely important point that we have to emphasize. There is no such thing as not voting. Not voting is voting. Not voting is voting to hand your power over to somebody else and preemptively say, please kick me, please abuse this, abuse me in my name. And we've got to change that frame of mind. And I think one of the things that we do at Citizen University um, is simply do this in a way that has a spirit of invitation that is not about partisan politics first. Probably our best known program is something called Civic Saturdays. And these are just gatherings that are kind of a civic equivalent to a faith gathering. Uh, They have the ark and the flow and the feel of faith gathering. We sing together. You'll hear readings. Um, There's a civic sermon at the heart of it. You turn to the strangers next to you and talk about uh, hard questions. And the reason why we put it in that ritual frame is that it works for everybody in different ways. Folks who are from small rural communities that are really religious, for them, it's plug and play. They know how to do this. Folks in unchurched Seattle um, who don't go to church, but who feel like they still need some place to make sense of things in fellowship and in community it works for them, right? And I think what we've learned in these different settings, and now by we've got a program where we're teaching people from all over the state, all over the United States to lead these gatherings on their own for their own communities is that people are starved. People are so hungry for an invitation to come into a circle with people, maybe strangers, maybe some friends, maybe people they've seen around, but just to say, can we make a community? Can we make sense of some stuff? It's not about electeds. It's not about national politics. It's can we take some responsibility for this place that is home? And I think that's a set of muscles that we got to rebuild and a set of habits we've got to rekindle. And I think it is possible. And I think um, it would be a great thing if more and more of us and a critical mass of us um, chose to do that. Jennifer Sherman, do you see examples of dialogue working, of, of conversation, which is where democracy begins? 
You know, I, I see that it works when it happens. I also see that as we become more divided as a society, it is harder and harder for those conversations to occur. But like Eric, I think people really, really want them. It's often that they just kind of don't know where to begin them, where to find each other. Um, our, our lives don't overlap much anymore with people who are less like us. Our social circles don't overlap much anymore with people who aren't like us. Um, so we really, it's, it becomes very easy to demonize and, and dehumanize people who are not like you when you don't know anyone like that. Um, and that occurs across the board, including in these really small towns that I study where you know, it used to be that the community acted more or less as a singular community, but over time as differences, whether it's social class or something else have gotten deeper and more entrenched, I am finding more and more that those with the most resources don't talk to those with the least and don't want to do with them because they see them as just having really different values, really different interests and, and imagine all sorts of motives there or belief systems that, that they don't agree with and don't understand. Um, I really liked that so many of the callers that, that you played talked about, we need, we need to foster dialogue, we need to foster compromise, we need to find ways to meet in the middle, because I think that can be done, and it is, but it, it does take actually listening to another person, um, you know, through efforts like Eric's, like, it does take spending some time together and seeing that other person as a human being who's worthy of respect, learning about their, their perspectives, their experiences, their trials, their joys, um, and creating more spaces for those kinds of civil interactions to occur between people who are different can go a really long way towards healing those divides. Um, and so I guess I would encourage everybody to, to think about where can you have that conversation with somebody who's not like you, where, where can you interact with somebody who's a little bit different? And it doesn't have to be in a formal setting. It can just be, you know, wherever, whatever institutions that you interact with on a daily basis. Uh, Secretary of State Kim Wyman, uh, the rest of us who are talking this evening, we don't represent the people the way that you do. You're an elected official. Everybody thinks they own a piece of the Secretary of State. When you hear this talk about conversation and dialogue, um, do you think that's possible in this in this current mindset? Oh, absolutely. I, I wouldn't have spent the last 40 years in public service if I didn't believe that uh, citizenship is a critical part of, of our society and our democracy at its foundation. And, and I don't think there's an easy magic bullet. I love the work that both Jennifer and Eric are doing because I think it's getting to the heart of the, the tough conversations we have to have. I think my years as a, an elected official at the county level and now at the state level have allowed me to go into rooms on both the left and the right and hear the, the dialogue um, sometimes things probably I'm not supposed to hear. And what I always have found interesting going back probably to George Bush one or George Bush two, uh, when he became president, and this is true in the Obama administration and the Trump administration, that when you, I would go into the uh, minority party's room, they would be so frustrated and just hate the president. And he's just stupid. And I don't like any of the policies and everything. And he's just a, a terrible human being. It did, you know, that was the left-leaning rooms under the Bush administration, right-leaning rooms under the Obama administration, and then back to the left under Trump. And and I say that because I think they think that they, that this this is unique. And it was it always kind of made me chuckle because it was the same thing in reverse in those rooms. And I say that because. Uh, in fact, WSU, the uh, Foley Institute, has done some incredible research and work on civic dialogue and civility. And one of the things that I love that they, they found in doing surveys of uh, lobbyists and elected officials and the public about the legislative process here in Olympia is that one thing that has eroded in the last particularly 20 years is that camaraderie that elected officials in Congress even um, experienced you know, back in the day has changed. And some of it is just the, the way they spend their evenings. You know, Back 20 years ago, in the evenings, they would go to dinner with each other. You know, Democrats and Republicans would sit around and talk about their families and talk about their lives, and they got to know each other they may still be polar opposite on what they believed in and what they fought for, but there was that human element that they saw each other as people. Now what they've seen in this research is that now they go to a lot of receptions 
and they're punching the ticket, going to four receptions a night to, to see the right people. And they don't talk to each other anymore, you know, just as people. And, and in Congress, same thing. They're flying home every weekend to, to go to district. You know, we're losing that humanity. So not only is it in the public sphere, it's in the political sphere and in, in the legislative sphere. And I think we have to get back to some of that to get to the, the root of being able to listen to each other. Spokane Public Radio's Doug Dvornik talk to two leaders about dialogue. Civic discourse isn't just a conversation between community leaders and the people they serve. It also includes the relationships among the people who hold office. For example, when leaders in the executive branch, mayors and county executives, can't get along with their counterparts who serve on city or county councils, it's hard to get anything useful done. In Spokane, the two leading elected officials say they're working hard to build that relationship. Though their offices are nonpartisan, Mayor Nadine Woodward and Council President Brian Beggs are philosophically different politically. Woodward is more conservative, Beggs more progressive. And yet they've generally worked well together since each began serving in their current positions at the beginning of 2020. I'll just tell you, I have worked so hard locally coming into office Um, to work with our city council, the seven members. I do one-on-ones with them. I I meet with Council President Beggs once a week. My priority was to build relationships when I came into this office with our city council, different branches of government, executive and legislative, so that we could lean in on the common ground and do the work of the city. But when we had differences, Doug, because we had those relationships built and a trust level there, that we could have those tough conversations. Face-to-face conversations humanize each other. And so I I can remember several times uh, being in meetings on Monday mornings, first thing with my staff and us being riled up about something and then like, okay, I'm going to have my Monday meeting with the mayor, which is a huge improvement from the last administration because it was not nearly as often. But then I go in and have a conversation with the mayor. We talk about it and we see each other that we're human beings. And suddenly it's not quite as rancorous. And uh, that seeing each other as human beings seems to be a very difficult thing to achieve these days. And Eric, you've talked a little bit about how you try to make that happen when it comes to the programs that you work on with Citizen University. But I'm curious about my other two guests. Uh, Kim Wyman, have you seen success in this way where people are able to meet just as human beings and kind of overcome these deep differences? Oh, oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, I think the advantage of, of being here during legislative session, and I've worked in Olympia now for 30 years almost, um, is you get to see that. And so there's always going to be the, the the tug of your political party wanting you to vote a certain way or take a stand on an issue and, and be with the team. But, you know, when you really watch the nitty gritty of the, the work that gets done here, it is that relationship building. It is those, those, those conversations that happen in the hall that uh, that are happening, you know, after the the hearing where they're just starting to to have a conversation and listen to each other. I think that's where the work gets done. And, uh, you know, in government, fast isn't always good. And I think that that having different points of view and, and taking time to think it through actually serves our, our the public better. I think in an ideal world, we could all talk and reason. But in this world, we all know that there are people who have no interest in engaging with other political perspectives, and many people are asking themselves, is it even worth it to have dialogue? KUOW's Kristen Leong spoke to two people with different perspectives. Jerome Hunter is the co-founder of the Seattle School for Boys, a middle school focused on problem-based learning and civic engagement. Melina White blogs at the Seattle Conservative. She and Jerome disagreed about whether or not it's worthwhile to try to understand the perspectives of far-right extremists, but they did find common ground around the perks of being multiracial. I have the privilege of being mixed race and gay and masculine of center, so I've been called pretty much everything you can think of throughout my life. Melina says that when she shares her political views in queer or POC communities, especially in Seattle, she's often met with shock and sometimes even disgust. She says that more than one straight white liberal has told her that being a conservative is a betrayal to who she is as a lesbian of color. We have to do the work to understand why people voted for Donald Trump in the first place, and not just assume that everybody who voted for Donald Trump voted for him because they hate immigrants, and they hate black people, and they hate gay people, and they hate transgender people. 
Jerome is firm in his stance that it is not productive to engage with people who do not believe that your life matters. For him, the insurrection attempt at the Capitol on January 6th validated his view that marginalized groups face legitimate danger in America. I don't really desire the other side to understand me per se. I I think that I have to be true to myself, be true to my values, respect folks in the way that I'd like to be respected. And if the other side, and I'm putting that in air quotes, doesn't see the humanity in me or see me for who I am, that's kind of more their responsibility. I think there's just work that I need to do that's more important sometimes than trying to convince the other side to understand me. Citizen University founder Eric Liu, what do you think about what Jerome had to say? There's some people he really doesn't care about trying to understand. Um, I think I think this. I think we have an opportunity right now um, with all that's broken in our society for actually creating some, uh, some bonds of empathy. Um, when you hear the pain in Jerome's voice um, about people who just simply do not think his life matters, um, and that feeling of being not just disrespected, but unseen or seen as something less than human, um, you are hearing something that I think um, I've heard from people all across this state. When I served on the State Board of Education and got outside of the Seattle area and was in the eastern part of the state or in the Tri-Cities or in Yakima or in Sunnyside and hearing people who feel like the system doesn't see me, people don't care about me, I'm just being ground down and no one cares, and just elites, decision makers are just imposing things on us. And, you know, the things that used to be said in negative ways about um, urban black families, about the dysfunction and single parent families and uh, and kids having kids and all that stuff. Well, now that those same patterns are, are unfolding, quite frankly, in white rural communities around the United States, now that there are crises of addiction and crises of joblessness, crises of broken families, in ways that cross the color line. We have a choice to make in our state and in this country. Are we gonna say now, I don't care about the other side because they don't see me or value me? Or are we gonna say, wow, both this group and that group have experienced and are experiencing the same pain and shame of being dehumanized and treated as human refuse. And we have to bring them together to say, we actually matter. And when we do that, we create an opportunity for people to recognize the ways in which there are structural differences. There are structural imbalances. Um, you may be poor and white, but you don't want to be poor and a person of color because the odds are even harder and longer against you. But you can't get to that until you first establish that capacity for empathy. And to me, when I hear, uh, whether it's those last two callers or Adam earlier from Yakima talking about the primacy of just rehumanizing and human relationship. This is, I'm not naive. A lot of what we teach at Citizen University is about power and power imbalance. Let's be real about power and what it takes to organize to build countervailing power. But power alone is not enough in politics and in a democracy. You've got to couple your literacy and power with an open human heart that's willing to empathize with the other. And that doesn't mean you got to betray your values. If you haven't figured it out, I'm a pretty progressive Democrat. I live in Seattle, you know, Uh, Kim and I don't agree probably on a whole bunch of issues. Um, But, uh, you know, the point isn't to split the difference between us. The point is for us to see each other as fully human, for us to listen to the folks that Jennifer's listening to and working with from all across the state and small towns that don't get the airtime, and then figure out what are the points of pain, hurt, and hope that these folks have in common, and how can we build an agenda from that? Jennifer Sherman, when you talk to... um poor white people in rural Washington state, do you hear that same sentiment that Jerome just expressed that I don't really want to deal with people who don't seem to respect me, who don't seem to see my humanity? And and is there any way around that, over that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I do hear echoes of that kind of feeling. Um, and I think it's totally understandable to feel that way when you don't feel respected and when you don't feel heard to, to feel like it's not worth it. I shouldn't have to explain myself. Um, and I don't, you know, I think at the, at that individual level, that can be really hard and perhaps it's the wrong approach. I don't necessarily believe it's anybody's responsibility to explain themselves or explain their political views or their experiences or their standpoint to anyone else, unless they trust that person enough to feel comfortable doing so. And what we heard in those, 
you know, from those callers is a real lack of trust of the other person. And for good reason, when you feel you've been attacked or been disrespected. Um, so I don't think that sharing those kinds of really intense and really personal perspectives is necessarily important or the only way to bridge the kinds of divides or humanize interactions like we're talking about. Um, I would encourage people instead to kind of think much smaller, um, find easy stuff to share the common ground rather than those big differences right away. I think what we need to work on is building trust in really small ways, um, getting enough interaction between people who think of themselves as miles apart to the point where they can't see each other's humanity and giving them the space to just get to know and like that other person as a person. And, you know, maybe eventually you understand where somebody else's belief comes from and why it makes sense to that person. And maybe you never do, but at least if you've learned to relate on, on some other level, you've come to see that those beliefs are held by a real human being with real experiences um, and redeeming qualities that you can start to recognize and maybe see that person as deserving of compassion. And to me, that's the beginning of learning on, to understand somebody else's journey and how it may be, ends with the beliefs that they hold that you're struggling to accept yourself. Um, but I, I think we, again, need to find more ways and more places to create those trusting relationships, to create those small interactions that allow us to see one another as human beings rather than just representations of some sort of ideological or, you know, some sort of other identity extreme. Um, I think in my work, I have the privilege, as you mentioned, of speaking in depth with people whose experiences are often so incredibly different from my own. Um, and yet in almost every interview I do, there's, there's some moment where I absolutely relate to what they're saying and I feel exactly what they're going through. Um, and maybe I've been through something very similar myself, despite really different contexts and that that moment of human connection can exist between almost any two human beings, honestly. We all share something at some level um, if you get to know somebody well enough. And that moment, that, that connection doesn't mean I always agree with or believe in everything the person I'm interviewing espouses. And I don't need to, to, to start to learn about them and understand who they are and see their humanity and their, their story. And I have to say, I've never regretted the time that I, I take to get to know and understand people who are really different, people who maybe are not well understood by a lot of our, our country and maybe aren't taken that seriously. I think any interaction like that, where you learn about somebody that, that you didn't understand beforehand can be so valuable. And it doesn't have to take the form of me defending my beliefs to you, but rather it can be just, you know, we are here doing some activity together that gives us a chance to, you know, just joke around and see that this is a, this is a funny person. This is a, you know, this is a person with some redeeming quality. And I, I think starting small might be um, a, a more realizable goal given the, the challenges we're facing in this country right now. You know, we're just about out of time, but Kim Wyman, I want to leave the last word to you as Secretary of State. We, we've talked about the personal level, and I'm going to bring it back up to the government level. A core division in our country is among people who believe that government is helpful to them and government is harmful to them. And you're a government official, and how do we kind of transcend that in 40 seconds? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I think it all goes back to civic engagement, and it is about listening to the people we represent as an elected official, that is first and foremost, um, and, and trying to represent 7 million people at any given day is, is a challenge. But, you know, I, I think it's about listening. I think the common thread of what we've been talking about tonight is uh, particularly listening to uh, people we don't agree with. And I'm going I, to I, have to leave it there okay. because <laughs> we're our time for talking about this and, and having people listen is just about over. Kim Wyman, thank you so much, Washington's Secretary of State. Also, you heard from Citizen University founder Eric Liu and Washington State University sociologist Jennifer Sherman. This has been Rebuilding Democracy, a special statewide broadcast and virtual event. Thanks to KUOW Events and Ops, Spokane Public Radio, and Northwest Public Broadcasting. Thanks to everyone who joined us this evening. If you're watching on YouTube today, subscribe to our channel below. Find out more in RSVP to our next event at KUOW.org slash events. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Ross Reynolds. Have a great evening.
This is KUOW FM Seattle, KUOW Tumwater, and KQOW Bellingham. This is Bill Radke on the next record, The Vaccine Passport, a certificate that.